we are going to dive into the intersection of Jedi and climate. Why investing in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion is crucial, and how this can be addressed by companies and investors. To moderate this panel, I am delighted personally to introduce Laura Dickinson, an individual and a leader I am proud to work with and shows the importance of this intersection in many ways. She's the co-founder and executive director of One Step Closer, also known as OSC, a natural products industry CEO group. Through OSC, she led and co-founded the Climate Collaborative and the Jedi Collaborative, two initiatives both working to catalyze much needed systemic change in the natural products industry. I now invite you to please take the stage, Laura, as you are here with me right now, and invite your fellow panelists. Thank you, Jasmine. Wow, it's so cool to be uh, here with you, our, our fearless project um, leader on many parts of the Jedi Collaborative. <laughs> and um, so I'll just share just for a moment uh, about the vision of the Jedi Collaborative. Um, we've been talking about it in bits and pieces today, so I won't go into too much detail, but just wanted to share that we um, started this collaborative with the vision of a natural products industry that centers justice, equity, diversity, inclusion at its core, at its core. And once you start to notice the lack of the diversity in the industry, it was something I'm embarrassed to say, I've been in the industry 25 years ago and I probably only noticed this four years ago, <laughs> that it's a very homogenous industry. Um, and once you see that, it's hard to unsee that. Well, it's not, not here, we're, we're doing pretty well at Food Funded today and some of our work, but overall we are a homogenous industry. And that lack of diversity will hold us back. Not only is it the right thing to do, which I think um, we see more and more and believe more and more, but I believe it's also our long-term path forward as business people and as an industry. Um, we will not thrive. We just won't thrive without embracing more diversity of um, in our community, especially in leadership positions. And one big thing we've noticed is the lack of funding for early stage entrepreneurs entrepreneurs and leaders. How can we embrace diversity at all levels without fostering this next generation of innovation in our industry? So the Jedi Collaborative, um, if, if we launched uh, this new resource a couple of months ago, among many of other tools and resources on this site, you will find in the resources section, the investor resource portal for early stage entrepreneurs of marginalized communities specifically for them where you can find resources and investors. Um, and so we're here today with Lina, Lina um, and uh, Green and Elisa Williams. And we're gonna go deeper into funding Jedi, the why, the what, and how of funding. So I'll start with introducing you, Lina, who has over three decades of experience in the tech industry and social impact space as a consultant, an entrepreneur, an investor, a mentor, and an educator. She's helped raise hundreds of millions of dollars for organizations of all sizes and is a co-founder of an angel impact network for women-led community-based enterprises called Angels of Impact. Lina is also the co-author of a book, Sustainable Impact, How Women Are Key to Ending Poverty. Why haven't I read that yet? That's next on my list. <laughs> Elisa Williams, um, I'm going to share about you next. Um, she is a partner of BMG Partners, a private equity firm that specializes in helping build iconic consumer brands. She, was, uh, she has worked with a number of brands in the BMG portfolio, including Drunk Elephant, Nature's Bakery, and Briagio. Prior to joining BMG, Elisa worked in investment banking at Wells Fargo. So I'm so excited to speak with the two of you and the radical work I think you're doing to break barriers um, and such an important um, part of this industry and in a, such an important part of investing. So I'm just gonna start, um, Lina, with you. Can you share what, what you've been working on in terms of investing in Jedi and your reasons for investing in Jedi? Why, why is this so important in general and to you? Thank you, Laura. Why is this work important? Because we have to say her name, Brianna Taylor, and there's so many lives that have been lost because of a system of racial prejudice. The so many missing and murdered Indigenous women who are invisible to the criminal justice system. The children in cages on the borders who are treated worse than animals. In the times of COVID, 
we have come to notice these injustices amplified in our lives. And Black Lives Matter has in fact gone global. Yet at the same time, we know that BIPOC entrepreneurs are resilient. They can actually do more with less, create successful businesses, are very innovative and are good investments. So I feel that we're not here just talking about diversity and inclusion, but justice and equity. And as Edgar Venezuela says in his book, Decolonizing Wealth, um, you know, it's about using medicine, uh, money as medicine as well. So I co-founded Angels of Impact as a social justice funding network of successful entrepreneurs giving back to support women of color, running community-based enterprises, tackling UN SDGs such as no poverty, environmental sustainability, and gender equality. We through, do this through an evergreen fund that enables Angels of Impact to customize entrepreneur-friendly financing terms. We also offer an ecosystem approach of support through incubation, mentorship, and even market access. Yeah. How I came into investing in Jedi, good mm -hmm. question. Partly because I'm a Baha'i and we are asked to help serve humanity and, but largely because my own lived experience as a woman of color, raising funds for my own ventures. You know, one example was back in the 2000s, I ran a very successful tech business with clients such as Cisco Systems, and I still couldn't get cash flow financing without personal guarantees, collaterals, and ridiculous financing terms. And even despite having account receivables from these companies. Yet I saw how financing easily flowed to my privileged male competitors, even to those without relevant experience and without the account receivables I had. And many of those companies have actually folded uh, and mine continued to succeed through two economic recessions and I've still sold that venture. And that's when I started investing back into women of color because I saw how women actually produce 20% more revenue with 50% less capital. It's a no brainer. They have great leverage, less risk and multiply impact. In fact, every dollar that a woman earns, she gives her back up to 90% to her family and her communities versus that of men who give up only about 30%. And yet black women, for example, in the US only receive 0.006% of the $425 billion available funding. And even lately with gender investing, gender lens investing, there is colorism there. A lot of BIPOC entrepreneurs still are not accessing that money. So I've experienced that myself when we were setting up our fund, the money wouldn't flow to us because we were women of color. And there was in fact an American lady who received the fund to actually come and set up and do what we were doing. And she had the audacity to come to me and ask me how to do it. <laughs> so instinctively in all my life, I had seen this but was, it was difficult to give it name. And I, I really thank the terminologies and framing that came out of Black Lives Matter because that has given me the language. And I've learned so much about investing in Jedi from people such as Rodney Foxworth, who's been very vocal about calling up the impact investing, do good, do well, is not really filling it. He actually called out about them. Uh, the system has an intentional design to keep marginalized communities down. And so these people have given me the language to recognize the system is not broke, it is fixed. It works with who it is meant to work and there's much that we need to do about it. One analogy would be when we see a, a dead fish in the water, we kind of wonder what happened to that fish. But when we have lots of dead fish, we should have a conversation about changing the water. And that's where we are today. And that's why I invest in Jedi. Yeah. Thank you. And so well said and comprehensive, Lina. And just the, the, the fact that there is, um, th that, you know, now is such a palpable time. I really got that from your, your, your sharing right now. And um, Elisa, I'd love to hear from you. And I'm sure a lot of folks you've, um, you've been doing really progressing at BMG and um, also um, investing. In, in some cool businesses. Can you talk about your Jedi investing um, work? What, what, what does your work look like? And why is this important to you and, and also to VMG? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would echo a lot of things that, that Lina shared. And I think the biggest being that th the system was created this mm -hmm. way. Uh, yeah. it, it is created such that uh, many of people of color will, will never have access. Mm -hmm. um, and and 
for, for years, that's, that's never been viewed as a problem. I think for me as a, as a black woman sitting on this side of the table, I, I see the product problem immediately. Um, whereas, you know, I think there are a lot of people, this is, this is a very new problem to them. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I sit in my seat as an investor because I think this, this problem is, is one of the most critical uh, that, that needs to be addressed. I, I work with uh, consumer brands and you think about consumers, generally speaking, uh, you, you think about the people spending uh, money across consumer products and uh, and and the, the the founders who are creating brands to address many of these consumers are not getting the resources for their brands to be uh, successful. And so I think it's, it's incredibly important to me because I, I, I see the gap, but I also see, uh, to, to Linus' point, just the level of, of creativity and scrappiness and um, level of innovation that exists with with uh, with many founders who are just not given the resources. And so I think if if we give these founders half of the resources that some other brands get, uh, it, it's it's crazy to think about how uh, successful they could be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure if it, you see that they've made it, made it already this far, how much further can they possibly go with all the barriers that um, we've constructed over the generations? Um, so, Lina, maybe you know, can, to build on what you were talking about before, how is Jedi investor relationships and models different? I mean, what, what would you say would be different from traditional or past models and how do we need to set them up differently? Yeah, I think to answer that question, we first have to take a pause and figure out what is the past system, right? Mm -hmm. So in a large premise is that the past system that we have has actually been made out of the backs of people and planet. Yep. And it's circulating that money within privilege. So when we talk about Jedi, we have to start from there. That's how I feel. We have to recognize that it, it is also a very extractive model of where wealth is in the hand of a few and they invest that into entrepreneurs who do the hard work and then they make the money as well. So today is an opportunity for us to look at more regenerative models that are different, right? Addressing that power gap. In fact, um, Rod at a recent con uh, conference that we just had talked about the fact that the funding, it was more of a power gap issue and less to do with an intellectual or a talent gap. Yeah. So once we take it from there and also recognizing that the do good, do well model, which was supposed to move away from the traditional model still comes from the idea of being able to do good and do market returns, you know, like really well. But yeah. what this happened, what this does then is you're extracting the value away from the community and the entrepreneur, right? It's still a relatively extractive model. So what we really need to look is at a different model in which we're trying to keep money as well in a win-win where the entrepreneur and the community can also develop their wealth. Right. So to me, investing in Jita is not just about flowing money to BIPOC, but also the terms of the investments, you know, mm -hmm. how not to just simply leverage, uh, you know, uh, leverage money to maximize returns. Right. Mm -hmm. How do we right size, you know, to enable the entrepreneurs and communities to to break the cycle of structural economic racism. Right. And to also find innovative ways. How can we have patient capital? How do we do revenue notes? How can we be more fair? You know, when people put money in a bank, you you get maybe, you know, 1% if you're lucky, you know, and yet when you put money into communities, you want to have 12, 24% return, you know, like where is, the, where is the, the place in which it's more of a fair return, right? To me also a Jedi investment model is what I've learned from Rodney and apparently it is, he attributes it to Namako Akbo, the restorative finance model. You know, in her website, she talks about how our current economic and political system was really built to harm. So this is another thing we have to recognize. The system was really designed to harm marginalized communities, to really keep them oppressed. So we need to change this and to dream bigger and build an economy that heals that harm and restores those communities. Another Jedi model that we could look at is traditional investment always looks at exit. But if we're trying to create generational wealth, exit has to look, be looked at differently. So Jenny Kassan, for example, has created this mechanism that you can actually have dividends from equity investments. You know, we can actually 
be very creative in the way we can actually have wealth creation for both the investor and the entrepreneur. And last but not least, metrics, for example, right? Impact investing, all of a sudden you go like, what's what's the good you're doing? Let's let's start measuring. And that equally is very onerous. And who is determining what is the metric? Should it be the community and the entrepreneur determining what's good for them? Or has does it have to be impact invest, you know, impact investors who determine that? So to me, investing in Jedi is not just about the flow of the money to BIPOC, but how we flow the money to BIPOC is equally mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Lina, you were talking about some pretty radical, crazy investment um, concepts, and I am like 100% on board. I'm just hoping, <laughs> hoping that we can um, move towards this in terms of, you know, just some of this amazing stuff, realizing that extraction has been the name of the game with old old style capitalism and, and the isms that we all, all address and, and um, are, are, are facing here. Um, Elisa, you know, speaking from the perspective of a more established private equity group, um, how does this resonate, and you know, in terms of what you're hearing, and what what would you say are some of the differences in terms of investment models that um, you think uh, um, are needed and, and can also be tolerated by by companies? Yeah, so it's interesting because again, I think I'm, I'm sitting on the side of of being in a more traditional. Uh, investment firm that is not necessarily just targeting Jedi investments and, and entrepreneurs, but I don't think that uh, it means that it can't be something that you focus on. And and I think the the only way you really make a difference is for something to be intentional. And so at VMG, we're thinking uh, very deeply about how we're ensuring we're being intentional about uh, making ourselves available to entrepreneurs who are coming from every walk of life. I, I think one of the biggest things I focus on and, and we focus on it as a firm is, is how do we level the playing field? Uh, mm -hmm. Are we considering the types of events we're going to, right? Are, are we in the right places? Uh, but most importantly, I, I think there's an element of uh, access and, and the networks that, that people have that is able to benefit some people and not others. So how are we able to yeah. uh, open ourselves up so that we're, creating networks for uh, for different founders and entrepreneurs. And I think one of the ways I try and do it is, is making myself accessible to founders who are um, way before the point where we would be able to invest. So if I have uh, conversations with people who are very early in their, in their brand and their business uh, and, and I'm able to provide resources to them, even if I'm not able to be the ultimate investor, you're helping them increase their network. I think the final thing uh, that, that Lina hit on that I think is really important is, again, there and many times there's a, there's a lack of, of knowledge uh, just about the investing space. And so it, it's super important to um, provide the education even when you're sitting across the table. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think a lot about uh, founders I've worked with and saying, you know, here's, here's the terms or the document and let me explain what this is, right? Because I don't ever want to be uh, in, a, in a position where I'm taking advantage of someone who has a lack of knowledge. So there's an education piece of it uh, that, that is super important from the investor seat that I think that more people have to adopt so that, again, we're, we're helping to level that playing field. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's, um, that's great. And you, know, you, you touched on something, um, Elisa, that is very important that I think we're starting to recognize um, beyond just all, all kinds of systems level barriers. Um, there are network barriers um, that we face when you think about growing up in a different community um, in potentially not having access to the same kind of education, um, uh, the resources and the support and the networks to get your first job and your next and your next. And um, so, and then that translates into the funding gap piece where um, we all know the proverbial friends, family, you know, there's three, I guess, but I won't say the third one, <laughs> um, um, friends and family funding um, that happens in this industry. And that is um, really critical. That's been sort of how we've done things. And, and so you, you, you touched on that a little bit, Elisa, but I'm wondering um, if you can speak but more on that, um, Lina and Elisa, in terms of those people with marginalized identities that we're referring to and that generational wealth gap 
that um, leads to funding gaps at early stages. How, how can we address this um, as an investment community? Yeah, actually, I think that's a really great question that you raised because that's something everyone takes for granted. Mm -hmm. you know, even when people do crowdfunding campaigns, for example, they, they basically you're relying on your social network, which a lot of marginalized communities don't have. And I think this again comes back to, I love asking the tough questions. I know that you guys knew that I do that when I was invited to speak at this panel, but I think we need to go back to the reality of why. Why are marginalized communities not having that access, right? Because we've had issues like, you know, red, red lining, share cropping, you know, funding gaps, the costly capital. I'm sure most of you would have heard recently about that mixed couple uh, when they were trying to get their house valued. And when there were pictures of the wife who's a black woman around, the valuation came back very low. But when they removed her pictures, the valuation went up. So we have to recognize that bias is there, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like organizations like Runway Project. So we need more organizations like Runway Project who recognize that BIPOC entrepreneurs often don't have that access to the friends and family network. Uh, in our funds in Angels of Impact, we are very cognizant of that because every entrepreneur that we deal with do, does not have that network. Um, but I also know of uh, like Jenny Kassan has a really good book I'd strongly recommend that empowers entrepreneurs to understand, don't wait for the term sheet to come from the investor. You can actually go out there, uh, Kai Norte, is amazing. She's got, you know, she works with Jenny and she actually has her term sheet. She knows exactly what to ask for. And they are more and more um, philanthropic. So for us, we actually also do work on getting philanthropic money to come into the space because a lot of times when you talk about angel investor or people who want to invest, there's a huge cognitive dissonance that comes in. People are used to giving money away for charity and they don't usually ask a lot of questions, but when they you start talking about investing that money, they immediately go to what's your huge rate of returns and your growth projections. There's a cognitive dissonance here, but there's actually a huge opportunity here for the use of philanthropic dollars to go into integrated capital where there is a blend between uh, and this kind of helps to make up for that lack of friends and family and risk capital that exists. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Elisa, what would you say about, you know, closing the gap in terms of, of funding? Yeah, I, I, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about it on the other side of the table and how do we get more mm -hmm. investors to understand the gap and understand, understand the bias. I, I, I think about um, sitting in a room as an investor and there's, you know, someone coming in to pitch and you spend about 30 seconds talking about a common interest or, you know, oh, do you have kids? I have kids. Oh, are you doing, you know, Zoom learning? I'm doing Zoom learning. Well, what if you don't have that, that common interest? Then, then what are you filling that space mm -hmm. with? Okay, well, now it's awkward, right? So people don't think about those um, connections that are impactful in terms of how they then view someone as a person, uh, they view their intellect. People are making decisions very early on before they've even had the chance to talk about their business. So how do we make people aware uh, that that exists and that that's not what you should be judging someone's business on or their plan on? Uh, and then I think there's an element too of um, many investors then having to spend time explaining their their business and educating the uh, many uh, entrepreneurs having to educate the investor on uh, their category or the trends and now you've taken another 20 minutes that by the time you've gotten to the point to really talking about what they're they're offering you've you've already filled the space with mm -hmm. um, things that that may be irrelevant or things that other uh, entrepreneurs don't have to spend time talking about so for me it's a lot of conversations on on our side of the table around moving past those things being aware of them understanding when you know, someone is coming in and, and pitching and you may not have interacted with, you know, someone with their background before, or you may not understand uh, the category, you know, that they're in doing the work before they come yeah. to the meeting so that they don't have to spend their time doing that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. And I don't think there's a real answer to make up for that gap because having, you know, friends and family dollars and, and things like that, it does make a difference and it does help, help businesses. Um, but, but if we can try and remove some of the bias that we have toward people that, um, you know, may be coming from different backgrounds, it can ultimately help us look at the investment with a very clear, clear head and not mm -hmm. influenced by things that, that we may not be aware of. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's powerful to hear you um, <clears throat> acknowledging the bias that exists and and some of the ways to remove it. Lina, I'm wondering if you you also touched on that a little bit in terms of the lady in her house and <laughs> and um, and the bias that we just don't it, is there. Um, it, can you talk a little bit more about you know interrupting that bias as an investor? I'm sure you you're pretty proactive at that, and, but how you maybe. Um, also think you could activate or we could activate other investors to to mitigate bias. Yeah, that's something that I've always um, found a little bit difficult to do because um, sometimes it's hard to tell the bias until you're actually faced with it, <laughs> you know. Um, so, for example, when I was running my own business in Asia, I gave the example about how I couldn't access yeah. funding. I also ran into that issue when I was actually running the company. And so, you know, because people would like not take your, then there's a whole credibility issue about whether or not you're credible enough to know how to run this company as well. Mm -hmm. So I actually ended up having to hire a, a retired white gentleman and I paid him to basically tell people what I want, I would have otherwise did. So it, it cost me money, but that was one way in which I overcame the bias because I needed to get the job done, um, you know, and Funding was, you know, I'll give you an example. When we were raising our fund in Asia, I told you about how there's one government that actually put $100 million aside specifically to fund women entrepreneurs and emerging markets as well. And we were so best positioned for it. We talked to them. Number one, they were very surprised that we even had a pipeline. You yeah. know, like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You mean there's all these women entrepreneurs around? Like, yeah. And But when it came to actually flowing, because they were a fund of funds, when it actually came to flowing the money, they didn't flow it to us. And so when I confronted them about it and I was like, why didn't you flow it to us? And then they said, oh, but impact investors are all men. So, you know, as a woman of color, you run into those two issues and I'm I'm still grappling with how to, to change that. Uh, but so far, the way I've been doing it is like one step at a time. Um, I'm sure Alyssa has the same um, yeah. issue. One of the common things I get is, a uh, beautiful compliment as far as the person is concerned, but they're like, you're actually very smart. And they are like, okay, was that an insult or a compliment? You know, uh, invisibility. Um, you know, I've had many situations where I do try to raise a point. I get talked over or interrupted. And when I confront the person after that, like, why did you interrupt me? They're like, oh, but I didn't see you. I didn't see you. And I didn't see you is so clear. Like, how do you how do you overcome stuff like that when people don't see you and they don't see you as credible? I have a Harvard Law degree uh, and I've got so many years of running uh, these companies and raising hundreds and millions of dollars mm -hmm. and yet I have to keep proving my credibility. So I'm not sure I have an answer for you, but right now my answer is I make sure that I bring in other champions involved as well. And sometimes if people are not going to listen to me, then hopefully they'll listen to them. Yeah. I think one of the beautiful things about the moment we're in right now, though, is is I actually think people um, are becoming a little bit less defensive mm -hmm. when you speak about about bias and and that it does exist. Where I think before mm -hmm. it was a little bit of, oh no, I would I would never think that, or I would never. Whereas now people are kind of taking a, a step back, and it's mm -hmm. acceptable to to have these conversations. And so you know, I, I I am feeling a bit more encouraged about about that uh, mm -hmm. in this space. As I, I just think more people have had their eyes kind of open um, over the last yeah. couple of months. Yeah, I totally agree. And that openness is um, is certainly, I, I think, a shifting. I just feel it in, in this community, which is maybe a little more woke and in myself. And Lina, I know you're incredibly um, well, well educated in what you do and also very direct. And I kind of admire that. I'll never forget where she called us out on our, our investor resource task force because we, call, we, we chose her last to speak and she was the only woman of color. And ever since I've always kept that in my mind, like, you're right, how did that happen? And I notice it when other people do it. And it really bothers me because I, and I'm not sure what's behind it. I don't, it's again, very unconscious bias, um, but they're just little signals all over the place. And I think that you mentioned, you know, people, people being more open and being open to the direct feedback is something I think we're in a position to do more. Yeah. Um, Alisa, I'm wondering if you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, actually, to take Alisa's point, I wouldn't have called it out before because it, the, the environment wasn't as such now. And I've actually gotten a little bit more bold about calling it yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. 
How about you, Elisa? Have you felt more empowered to call out bias or areas where, you know, folks are missing the idea on investing? Yeah, I, I, I definitely felt more empowered. Um, but, but a lot of times I end up saying, you know, it, it's not my obligation or responsibility as a black woman to educate people on bias or, or, um, you know, experiences that, that they need to kind of yeah. go on their own journey. So for me, I, I, I choose it, um, selectively yeah. because if not, it, it's, it can be draining to always have to be totally. the person pointing something out. Yeah. Uh, but, but when I do want to point it out, I do feel, uh, more, more empowered to do so. Yeah. And that's a great point. I mean, that's not up to you to bear the emotional labor of people who are having bias. Cause that's, you know, that's then a whole lot to educate. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more, Elisa, about any, any personal challenges you've had as a BIPOC woman um, in the investment industry. I mean, you've broken some major, you know, ground ceilings, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, in this industry, as has Lina. Can you talk about any barriers or challenges if you've had along the way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's an element of um, people being surprised as, as Lina said, that that uh, you are where you are. I, I've had people um, think that I am, you know, the the admin or an, a position that is not uh, the investor, which is, you know, it's 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 um, coming from a perspective of she could never be in that in that seat. Uh, I've had people come in to meet with me and not think they were meeting with me, but thinking that they're going to wait on someone else. So. Um, it, 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 it actually is, is quite, um, it, it can be quite draining, uh, just mm -hmm. to always have to live in a space where you feel like you have to prove yourself. Whereas I think other people, um, you know, are able to reach a certain position and then feel like they've proven, uh, mm -hmm. proven themselves. And so, um, you know, I think that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a constant, constant, uh, challenge and it doesn't, it doesn't go away. Uh, but I also think that there's, um, just such a, a um, void and, and, and gap that needs to be filled by, uh, you know, other people of color who are, are uh, able to occupy these spaces as, as the, uh, as the investor. I just think it's, it's, it's something that um, we should all be continuing to focus on because the, the more um, investors there are on the table that can understand uh, diversity in, in different communities, the more access and dollars that uh, we'll continue to see funneling to uh, entrepreneurs of color. Right on. I mean, may, people making the decisions need to be the, the people relating and having that perspective to empower those marginalized community entrepreneurs. And that's, I mean, and Elisa, like so awesome that you have, I mean, just to, to make your way and listening to the barriers that you faced and to continue to progress and just, I mean, my, my, you know, Oz is kind of like totally there with you in terms of um, what you've been able to accomplish. Cause I can only imagine it's been doubly hard as you know, others in, in your, your same position. So um, right on. Um, Lina, can you share, it looks like we have about a minute left. Um, any last thoughts you have on um, your own, um, you know, challenges and anything you'd, you'd offer up to other potentially women of color who are wanting to succeed? Yeah. yeah, I'll just say that actually we we are at a wonderful juncture right now that despite the pandemic and everything that's been happening, it's actually brought a confluence of people who really want to make change. Mm -hmm. And that's been very heartening for me. So um, BIPOC entrepreneurs have faith. There are good people out there and there are people who want to do things differently. And for all the woke investors out there, I'd say, look into restorative financing, look at innovative ways in which you can flow money that can actually heal the harm that we had in this world. So mm -hmm. it's good for all of us. We will create a just and regenerative world where all of us get to thrive because mm -hmm. the world that we have right now is divided and broken and it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, Lina, and Alyssa. Wow.
I could, Lisa, I could, I could speak to you all, all day. Um, but just saying, you know, thank you all so much. Lara, thank you so much for guiding us through this conversation. And Elisa and Lina, thank you so much for your presence and simply kind of being open and honest with us about the changes that still need to be made, um, but how you are working to change it. And so, you know, I know the audience definitely has some questions after this panel.